Hi, everybody. Um, so this talk will be about a fairly specific applied problem, and that is what is the best way to drive switching in a magnetic in a magnetic memory device with perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. So um, the idea is we we have a nice magnetic memory element, so the, the magnetic tunnel junction. It's desired to use magnetic materials with perpendicular magnetic anisotropy to make these bits thermally stable as small as possible. And uh, the challenge is to try to find the best possible way to switch between parallel and anti-parallel configurations to make a memory. So there's a pretty good way of doing this already, spin transfer torque from conventional, um, from spin polarized currents. Um, this is, is, is in production now. It, it's, it's, it seems to be growing. And um, I've heard that it will replace flash memory uh, for embedded memory applications in the, in the next generation of devices. So that all looks like it's going well. Um, but there is a limitation on how efficient that conventional spin transfer torque could be. And it's a good question whether it's possible to, to do better than that. And to do better than that means not just ha having sort of lower current and, and power, but a rather long list of virtues in terms of you know, having deterministic switching, having things reliable and fast, um, a, a wide variety of, of different virtues we need to meet. So um, there's a variety of mechanisms that are under investigation for doing this, both current-driven mechanisms and voltage-driven mechanisms. But I'll be focusing on, on a current-driven mechanism, sort of spin orbit torque. Um, so uh, I'll be thinking about devices like this, where we have a magnetic tunnel junction memory element, and we'll pass current in a channel underneath that memory element to generate a vertically flowing spin current that can uh, apply a spin transfer torque to the, to the lower magnetic electrode of that tunnel junction. Um, so this is an attractive uh, mechanism because it naturally allows higher efficiency than conventional spin transfer torque. Conventional spin transfer torque is essentially limited to an efficiency of torque no more than about one unit of h-bar over two um, angular momentum transferred per unit charge in the current. And spin orbit torque allows better efficiencies than that, essentially because each electron can transfer angular momentum several times as it goes through the device, and not just once. What's been achieved so far in terms of the spin torque efficiencies in units of h-bar over two is, as you can express in sort of this, this simple formula, it's given by a materials dependent parameter, the, the spin torque efficiency, um, which in heavy metal alloys is up to about 0.6 now and is greater than one for several oxides and topological materials. So it's that, it's that sort of materials parameter times a geometric factor, essentially the length of your device divided by the spin diffusion length. So together, these factors can easily give efficiencies of factor an order of magnitude or more um, compared to conventional spin transfer torque. Um, so that's very nice. Um, this mechanism also allows faster switching than conventional spin transfer torque, but there are disadvantages. Um, first of all, there's a density cost. This is a three terminal device rather than a two terminal device for the conventional devices. Um, so that, that's bad, um, but there might be ways around that in terms of sort of having more than one device share the same channel. The more fundamental disadvantage has to do with the orientation of the torque vector. And that's the main topic of my talk today. Okay, so this has to do with symmetry, and basically because of fundamental symmetries, the orientation of the spin that's generated by spin over torque can only point in one direction, and that's in the plane of your device and perpendicular to the charge current. You can see how this comes about from a picture of kind of the spin Hall effect, that uh, the direction of spin generated by the, that effect is always perpendicular to both the charge current and the direction of the spin flow. But it, it's more fundamental than just that mechanism. This is a, a, a fundamental con, uh, effective symmetry, and it will apply to whatever mechanism is generating the spin current in this kind of geometry. Um, so uh, the basic idea is if you want to generate an out-of-plane component of spin current, which is, would be, as I'll explain, um, more useful for switching out-of-plane devices with perpendicular anisotropy, you need to have some sort of symmetry breaking. You need to have a, a low symmetry material and uh, you need to have material that, that has at most one mirror plane um, perpendicular to the sample, and you must apply a, a charge perpendicular to that mirror plane, at least a component of perpendicular that mirror plane. So um, this has important consequences for um, the, the, the kind of magnetic manipulation you can do. This in-plane spin from the spin over torque is ideal for switching magnet, magnet devices with in-plane anisotropy because the, uh, this component spin can provide an anti-damping switching and provide uh, in which the magnet sort of uh, 
rotates gradually away from its its uh, from its uh, anisotropy direction and can gradually overcome the barrier and switch. Um, so that's given by it. the net torque necessary to do that is essentially given by the anisotropy field holding the magnet in place times the magnetic damping parameter, which uh, can be very small. Um, so you can get very efficient switching very fast in this geometry. You can also drive nice nano oscillations driven by DC current. But there's a limit to how dense you can make these devices because it's hard to make in-plane magnetic anisotropy devices very small without them becoming thoroughly unstable. So um, industry wants perpendicular magnetic anisotropy devices. This in-plane torque can reasonably efficiently switch micron scale PMA devices by moving domain walls around. But if you really want to scale down well below 100 nanometers to make practical devices, that mechanism isn't really available. You need a more macro spin kind of switching process. And there, this torque must then overcome the full magnetic anisotropy rather than just the damping. So there's a, there's a cost of, of about a factor of 100 greater torque needed to get switching to happen in that geometry. So that's what we're trying to avoid here. So if we could generate an out-of-plane spin and associate out-of-plane anti-damping torque, it would be possible to make much more efficient uh, devices, magnetic, sort of memory devices with perpendicular magnetic isotropy. Azad Naemi's group from Georgia Tech has done uh, detailed circuit level calculations about what, what parameters are needed. And they've shown that a, a spin torque ratio corresponding to an out of plane anti damping torque of only about 0 0.03 to 0 0.04 would allow sort of this spin over torque MRAM to then beat this conventional STT MRAM, the conventional spin transfer torque. And so that's that's a efficiency that's already a factor of 10 less than the conventional spin transfer torque efficiency. So I think that's something definitely we can aim at. If you could achieve out-of-plane anti-damping torque efficiencies comparable to what's already been achieved for the in-plane spin torque efficiencies of about 0.3 or more, that would then allow the spin over torque MRAM to be more energy efficient even than SRAM, which would be a, a very attractive thing. So that's, that's the thing we want to aim for um, with new materials in this talk. And I should say we, we haven't achieved that yet, um, but we're getting close to the, the, the threshold needed to have this spin or torque MRAM be conventional with the STT MRAM. And there'll be lots of sort of good ideas about how to do better than what we've done so far. Okay, so um, how would you go about using a lower symmetry material to generate spin over torque? Uh, well, there's at least three different ways you can think of for uh, lowering the symmetry of the spin over torque source materials. And I'll talk about each of these uh, in turn. And I, I've just given a bunch of references to the earlier work here, if you sort of wanna sort of study what's been done on your own separately. Um, you can first of all think about using sort of low crystalline symmetries uh, to, break, to break the necessary symmetries. You can think about using ferromagnets as your source of spin current, where the ferromagnetic moment would be the source of the broken symmetry. And also recent experiments have shown that antiferromagnets have enough lowering of symmetry to produce these out-of-plane anti-damping stores too. Uh, and Professor Tani already talked about this a little bit in the last time. Okay, so um, just a bit of background before we get to the, the results of the different materials. If you have a low symmetry material now generating spins and spin over torque, the spin uh, generated by this, the, this, these processes can now point in any direction, X, Y, and Z with different components. Um, and then that allows a variety of different kinds of symmetries of torque, either field-like torques or anti-damping-like torques associated with each component of these spins. I'll mostly be focusing on the out-of-plane anti-damping torques, which have the symmetry. So uh, if you want to think about how to measure these torques, there are now a variety of methods people have used to measure spin over torques. Um, I don't want to go into detail about all the different mechanisms, except to note that the state of affairs is still somewhat unsatisfactory and that different techniques can often give different values. Um, even for simple materials like platinum, this is true. So I, I think this shows there's still sort of missing physics we don't understand in terms of it, interpreting several of these kind of measurement mechanisms. But in this talk, I'll focus on two, me two measurement mechanisms that um, we trust more than most, um, which are spin torque parametric resonance and second harmonic hall measurements of samples with in-plane magnetic and isotropy. Um, but I'm happy to talk offline if people are interested in sort of my views of the strengths and weaknesses of the different measurement techniques. Okay, so just a brief in introduction to spin torque parametric resonance. The idea here is just to take a simple bilayer of your spin source material 
in a ferromagnet, we'll use in-plane anisotropy ferromagnets. You can pass an RF current uh, to generate magnetic precession in the magnetic layer. The current can produce both out-of-plane and in-plane torques on the magnetization. Uh, if you sweep the magnetic field through the resonance condition of the ferromagnetic resonance, um, the, uh, these, these oscillating torques will produce precession with an oscillating resistance. The oscillating resistance will mix with the oscillating current you're applying to give a DC signal a readout on resonance, and you'll see a, a resonance peak shape look something like this. You can decompose that into a symmetric and anti-symmetric peak shape. The symmetric peak shape is associated with the uh, in-plane torque, and the asymmetric component is associated with the out of plane torque. And so by measuring those, you can get quantitative information about the strengths of the torques. And by rotating the direction of the magnetic field in plane, you can separate out the different, the different components of torque corresponding to different spins. OK. So um, thinking about first low crystalline symmetry materials, um, when we began our experiments on these kinds of uh, on these kinds of ideas, um, we were worried about doing them trying trying to do experiments on any kind of deposited three D material, just because even if the materials have low symmetry, you have to worry about twinning domains and things like that. We'd worried that sort of uh, the effects would cancel. So to get started in this field, we we wanted to look at real single crystals, and it was convenient to look um, first at transition metal dichotrogenide semimetals, which naturally have uh, low, low symmetries due to distortions of the hexagonal crystal structure. And also just with exfoliation, you can easily prepare um, sort of good single crystals without even any crystal in steps. So um, we uh, used these materials, it did the last stage of exfoliation in the vacuum of our sputter chamber to avoid uh, sort of um, complications from air exposure. And then as gently as we could, deposited magnetic material on top to make our, our bilayer test device. Um, and then we performed STFMR to kind of see what they show. So um, before I get on to sort of showing what happens with these low materials, just a bit of review about what happens if you use high materials and look at STFMR. We'll look at the anti-symmetric component of the STFMR signal to be thinking about the out-of-plane torques. Um, and if you measure the out-of-plane torques in just in a simple permaloid platinum devices, with platinum being a high material, as a function of the angle of the magnetic field applied in plane, you see this nice regular uh, variation in what the amplitude of the STFMR signal is. You can fit the signal very well by a, a simple, simple formula, a sine 2 phi times cosine phi. You can understand the sine 2 phi part as being the sensitivity of the readout due to the uh, anisotropic magnetic resistance. And uh, the cosine phi sort of um, is given by the, the torque corresponding to um, you know, how far the magnetization angle is away from the, uh, the, the in-plane spins. So all that's easy to understand. In particular, if you sort of do the experiment by just reversing the magnetic field by 180 degrees, thinking about these two blue spots, the signal itself just reverses. And that corresponds to the two-fold rotational symmetry of these high symmetry samples. And so this just shows what the STFMR resonance looks like for platinum permaloy. Um, sort of looking, just sort of rotating the magnetic field just by 180 degrees. Now, instead of looking at a high symmetry material, if you look at a low symmetry material, here, uh, tungsten ditelluride with permaloy on top. Here, you can immediately see with these sort of simple 180 degree rotations that the, the experiments are no longer equivalent. And this directly reflects the lack of 180 degree rotational symmetry in the WTE2 crystal structure. So you can do the same experiment I talked about for platinum permaloy, looking at the amplitude of the out-of-plane anti-damping, out-of-plane torque signal as a function of the uh, uh, in-plane magnetic field. You can see now the angle dependence is very different than for the high symmetry platinum material, but it can still be fit by a simple formula. Now, instead of just a sine two phi times a cosine phi, there's also a sine two phi with a, just a constant term associated with it. And so that is the kind of effect you'd expect from an out-of-plane anti-damping torque. And this allows a measurement of the strength of that, that out-of-plane anti-damping. So as one check about that you're not fooling yourself with these kinds of measurements, you can make sure that uh, this effect has the right dependence as the angle of current relative to the crystal axes. In particular, tungsten ditelluride does have a mirror plane. And uh, just by symmetry, the, this out-of-plane anti-damping torque should go to zero as you tune the current Toward that mirror plane. And that's what's seen, that's exactly what's seen both for tungsten ditelluride 
and for molybdenum ditelluride, the, the two TMD materials in which we've seen these uh, autoplane anti-tamping torques occur. So that's all very nice. Um, in terms of the maximum perpendicular torque efficiency that we've measured in these TMD materials, the maximum one is for tungsten ditelluride, and that gives us an autoplane torque efficiency of about 0 0.014. Um, so quite small compared to the in-plane torque efficiencies of, of the best heavy metals and heavy metal alloys. Um, but actually not too far from our goal about what would be needed to have this um, spin rotor torque give more, better performance than conventional STT. Uh, we need, just need about another factor of two or three or so for that, so that first stage goal. So um, not, not quite what we need to be of interest for applications right away, but, but not a bad result for just a first attempt, a first guess about a material to look at. So um, at this point, my group is trying to think about whether we can expand this idea beyond two materials. And uh, due to a, sort of nice discussions with Evgeny Symbol of, of Nebraska, uh, we think there's a route forward to doing much better than what we've done so far, um, though these experiments are just starting. The idea is that we were probably wrong in our initial worries about trying to use 3D materials for generating low symmetry materials, that it should be possibly use materials that, that don't have very low symmetry, but still low enough symmetry to give interesting results. And so I'm, I'm trying to pick that with this picture here. The idea being that it be, should be possible to use reasonably high symmetry materials here, just sort of an orthorhombic material, uh, where just the structure along the z-axis of the crystal is different along x and y. And that should be enough if the materials are grown correctly to give out of plane anti-damping towards two. So the idea, first of all, is if you grow the, this material just with the z-axis of the crystal perpendicular to your film plane, sort of along an 001 direction. Um, that might produce electric field generated spin currents like this, say different spin currents flowing in the z direction than in, in the x direction. So that won't give any autoplane anti-damping torques. The, the, the spins flowing to the magnet are still rigidly in plane. However, if you grow that same crystal uh, sort of off axis, say a, a 101 direction, um, so the, our, my spin axes are then rotated for corresponding to crystal direction. The spin hall effect is a linear effect. Now um, you have sort of components both along the 001 axis and the 00 and the 100 axis. Both of those sort of currents will be flowing then out of the crystal plane. And the idea is for an orthorhombic material, the, the blue spins will not have the same magnitude as the red spin currents. They won't cancel, the out of plane component won't cancel in this geometry. And you've got out of plane torque corresponding to sort of an, an A minus B times an angular factor here. So our hope is with this geometry to be able to get out of plane torque efficiencies more comparable to the in plane torque efficiencies in heavy metals. And DFT calculations have suggested a number of materials that should be quite anisotropic according to their spin hall effect. And we'll be trying to make measurements uh, on those in the in the coming months. Okay, so I move on to talk about magnetic materials as, as spin source layers. Um, there's been quite a lot of work about this with different groups, and I'll just try to summarize what the current state of the of the art is here. Um, it's now understood there are several different physical mechanisms by which a magnetic source layer can produce out of plane spins. Um, and they have different dependencies on the orientation of this of the magnetization in the in-plane source of, of the of the magnetic source layer. Um, the simplest sort of effects correspond to having just an in-plane magnetization uh, pointed along the current axis. Either spin rotation or spin swapping effects can give out of plane spin currents um, from this kind of effect. I won't talk too much more about these though, because the measurements done, this appears to be weak. These effects are strong enough to provide some symmetry breaking to allow um, sort of the conventional spin or torque to give deterministic switching, but the measurements don't seem to indicate that this will get us close to our goal of producing uh, efficient out-of-plane anti-damping torque switching. More interesting to me are effects associated with the spin anomalous Hall effect and anisotropic magnetic resistance. Um, these depend on the magnetization of the source layer with these kinds of effects. And both of these effects require um, a, magnetiz a magnetization that's not rigidly in plane or out of plane. They require a, a, the magnetization of the source layer be tilted in between those two orientations. If, if MZ is equal to Z, either zero or one, both of these effects give sort of zero out of plane anti -damping. So that's a challenge. Um, to use either of these, would, you need to make a source layer with the magnetization tilted partly out of plane. So, um, 
There are ways to think about doing that with uh, bulk magnetic anisotropy. Our group has tried a couple of things so far that haven't worked, but, but we're still working away on that. But I do want to sort of give you reasons for hope that this might, um, might be a good idea, that uh, Secchi et al. have done nice experiments with uh, samples with in-plane magnetic anisotropy showing this effect, the spin anomalous Hall effect, can give large conventional spin torque efficiencies about 0.25. So if we can just simply um, tilt the magnetization out of plane partly uh, in equilibrium, that shows that the effect is, is already as strong as we want it to be. Um, so Fransky et al. from UC Irvine have also shown that um, strong spin currents generated by the AMR effect um, using experiments done at large magnetic fields to tilt the magnetization um, rather than having it the tilting occur at zero magnitude. So I think this is a promising direction as well, um, but there's still work to done to make a, the magnetic source layer partially tilted out of plane. So um, then I'll finish with a, a few words about antiferromagnets. Um, uh, again, this, this is nice work done by several groups here. L like the ferromagnets, the antiferromagnet source layers, it appears to be several different mechanisms that can generate out of plane spins from current distance effects. And I'll talk about sort of two effects, one with non-collinear antiferromagnets and the other with collinear antiferromagnets. So the, the non-collinear antiferromagnet we've been exploring is manganese three gallium nitride. Um, it has uh, um, sort of a similar spin structure compared to with the, the manganese three tin that Professor Aitani talked about. And this, uh, if you think about looking down the O1 plane, does have sufficiently low symmetry to generate the out-of-plane spins that we want to think about. So uh, Tan Shing Nan in our group, working along with Chung Mam Ohm's group at Wisconsin, just looked at a sort of simple manganese three gallium nitride devices and permalloy devices with, with a bit of copper space in between them, doing our standard uh, spin torque thermic resonance experiment. We can do these as a function of temperature and uh, by sort of starting at high temperature and reducing the temperature through the nail point of the manganese three gallium nitride, we can look at the, the effects of the spin or torques both with the disordered spin structure and the ordered antiferromagnetic spin structure. What we see going through this transition is that the conventional spin transfer torque, the spins in the Y direction, don't really do much at the nail temperature, but we do see uh, spin, spin signals corresponding to both the X and Z directions turn on uh, when the, when the antiferromagnetic order comes into play. In terms of the efficiency of the torque, it's about 0 0.019, so very similar to what we've seen with the Tufts and ditellurides so far not far from our goal of being competitive with STTM. So this is nice, but it's still kind of strange um, in the sense that we've done nothing to try to control the antiferromic domain orientation of these devices. And one would expect if you have uh, device, antiferromic domains sort of smaller than your device scale, which we do, that you, the, the out of plane, these unconventional torque effects would cancel because the different domains would give uh, um, orientations of spins in different directions. And that is exactly what you should expect from different domain configurations. Um, you should expect cancellation if you have an equal number of the equal mixture of different domain types. Uh, we've done X-ray exper experiments to actually try to measure what the size of domains in our devices are, and they are small, it's typically two to three, three, two to three hundred nanometers, and that's much smaller than the tens of nano, tens of micron device sizes that we make these measurements with. So it's not clear why we don't have an equal mixture of different domain sizes, different domain types. That's still an ongoing mystery, but it does give us some hope about improving these results, that if we can make more monodomain type samples, this effect should give uh, larger uh, out-of-plane anti-damping torques even than what we've measured so far. And then I, I do want to mention also uh, recent results on a collinear anti antiferment, ruthenium oxide. Ruthenium, uh, oxide. ruthenium oxide is a very interesting structure. It has two, two spin sublattices. And the, um, the spin sublattices themselves are both due to ruthenium, um, but the different spin sublattices have different orientations of the oxygen octahedra around these spins, these, these ruthenium atoms. And that causes an interesting uh, shape of the Fermi surfaces. You essentially have a, a, a different orientations of the spin up and spin down Fermi surfaces due to this different crystalline structure. So you have a spin splitting of the Fermi surfaces associated with the structure. Um, and this allows a, a, a current-induced charge flow to naturally produce spin flows through effects of sort of exchange interactions and in, in crystal field splittings rather than from spin orbit interactions. The idea, for instance, if we flow electrons to the left here, we'll have more left-going electrons and right-going electrons. 
but since the spin up electrons in green are uh, the, the Fermi surface is 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 anisotropic, you'll have more spin up electrons flowing to the right of the upwards in the diagram here, more spin down electrons in pink flowing below. Naturally, because of the spin split Fermi surface, the charge flow will induce a, a transverse spin flow in this challenge. So just like for the ferromagnets, this should produce um, sort of sp spin currents with spin oriented along the nail director direction. So if you orient the nail director partly tilted out of the plane, this, this should produce out of plane spin currents as well. And that is what we've measured. I'm, I'm running low on time, so I won't go through all the details, but we've looked at different crystalline orientations of this of this ruthenium oxide, some of which should not give any out of plane anti-damping torque. And if we, in some of which in which the nail belter is properly tilted, should give the out of plane anti-damping torque. We've looked at the effects of the torque as a function of the direction of current relative to different crystalline axes. And we find very good agreement with what's expected from a um, um, uh, from the theory from the spin splitting mechanism that we see a, a spin current with spin oriented approximately uh, parallel with the nail vector of the material. So by controlling the nail vector and tilting appropriately, you can get out of plane spins from this mechanism too. Okay. So um, as a last slide, I'll just summarize sort of what's been done so far with the out of plane anti damping torque efficiencies both with fields with low crystalline symmetry and with the anti-ferromagnets. Um, uh, we're not far from actually having these be sort of useful torques. In fact, the, the best results I've seen are from, from the Song group at Tsinghua, already about 0.03 for the autoplane for uh, an orientation of manganese 3 plat. Um, so I just want to thank um, the many students and postdocs who've contributed this work, and also a number of other groups who provided materials or helped us with characterization. And just summarize by saying that I think trying to find materials that are capable of generating on a plane anti damping torques are um, uh, a, a very good strategy for trying to make spin magnetic memory devices more efficient. Um, there's a number of strategies one can use for trying to get low enough symmetry materials to generate these on a plane anti damping torques. Um, and there's, I think, clear paths forward for all three of these strategies, either by using sort of anisotropic 3D materials. Tilt, finding a way to tilt the ferromagnetic source layers with the magnetic layer partly tilted out of the plane, or working on controlling the domain structure in antiferro.